Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Want to be the superhero that solves problems. And that's a lot of your content that people share. And But you also want to be relatable because you don't want to be too intimidating and too over the top and too unapproachable because you're on the mountaintop and you, you know. So the way that you come down that mountain and meet your audience halfway is by sharing aspects of your life that they can relate to. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't listened yet to my recent conversations with marketing consultant Nick Smith and with poly innovator Dustin Miller, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation, of course. Today, I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, John D'Amato, who's a branded lifestyle portrait and virtual photographer. He collaborates with speakers, trainers, and other expert-based business owners to create an emotional connection with their audiences through persuasive visual storytelling. More than a photographer, John sets his clients up for success beyond the photo sessions by coaching them on how to best leverage their image content for every touchpoint across their online presence. A former television producer, John has over 20 years of production experience and has been featured as a portrait photographer expert on several NBC Universal daytime shows. In our discussion today, John talked to me about what makes a good visual story. He explained the strategy behind successful photographs that build an emotional connection with your dream clients. And he gave lighting tips for great online meetings. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from John D'Amato. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from New York in the USA, John D'Amato, who's a lifestyle portrait event and virtual photographer He helps speakers and trainers create persuasive visual stories that build an emotional connection with their audience. So as a photographer and storyteller, visual storyteller and creating that emotional connection, I think we've got lots in common. So welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, John. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Michael Roderick, who was our guest on episode 328 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you and he introduced us so big hello to michael michael is a a very important person in the growth of my business based on a lot of the sage advice he's imparted upon me throughout the years so (laughs) yeah yeah and i always love getting his daily email and reading and he speaking of storytellers he tells some beautiful stories there in in words though (laughs) no absolutely absolutely uh yeah i'm on that list as well Hmm. Now, one of the things I was fascinated about when I looked into your background and you were just telling me off um, before we recorded that you're a television producer, so obviously you made that transition to photographer, but recently you've kind of gotten into the world of virtual photography, so I'm really keen to understand more. What is virtual photography and how did you get started with that? 
Well, up until April of this year, I didn't have any idea of what virtual photography is either. So <laughs> we're in the same boat. <laughs> uh, actually, what is virtual photography? It is the opportunity for speakers and experts and different people who share their um, their frameworks, their IP, their offers through a virtual landscape to show their potential audience, their potential clients, what the experience of working with them looks like. So it just so happened that I started it uh, in April when uh, I'm a photography sponsor for the National Speakers Association, New York City chapter here in America. And, you know, usually I go in and capture photos of their event meetings. And mm. obviously that didn't happen in April, but they had a virtual event and I just wanted to show up and watch it. But the next thing you know, I got a little antsy, picked up the camera, started pointing the camera at the laptop and photographed uh, some of the speakers that were on there. And uh, quite frankly, I mean, I was sick. I had COVID. I wasn't feeling well. And I just wanted to feel a little bit more like myself and be useful because, you know, I'm a sponsor for these people and I've been photographing their events for, you know, almost two years at that point. So felt the obligation. Next thing you know, it became a business and here we are. Hmm. All right. Well, that, that's fascinating. So, and obviously with um, the social distancing or physical distancing, let's call it, that um, we're experiencing throughout this pandemic that that's severely restricted your opportunities to do in-person photography and doing doing it virtually in the way you've described opens up a whole new set of opportunities i'm i'm kind of curious and i mean i don't want to go down the alley of the um, geeking out on the technology and that kind of thing but i'm kind of curious i've taken photographs of my screen and i always get these funny lines on there how do, how do you um do the photography in a way that a is better than just a screenshot um, which you can do off the screen through the software of the pc and and b you avoid any kind of reflections or anomalies that that you get off lcd screens when you're taking a photo with a camera right well number one there is a difference between archiving an event and capturing the moment the energy the people the content of the event. When you take a screenshot, your best bet is getting the archive. You're not going to create a, 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 an opportunity for people to feel like they missed out on something because the image ju just draws them in. You will never get that from a screenshot. But what you get when you have a professional eye shooting these things, it helps create an opportunity to position this screen in the same way and manner that a speaker on a stage looks. You know, you're capturing that energy, that vibrancy, that power, that confidence, that expertise, all of it in their body language, in their eyes, in their hands, all of those things. And, you know, as a professional, that's what I'm going for. It doesn't matter that it's on a screen, on a folding table in my apartment. What matters is that I'm positioning this laptop in a way that's going to convey to the people at home, you're going to still be transformed if you hire me to do the thing that you need me to do with you or for you, right? So that's the difference. Now, technically speaking, I, I get lines, I get glare, I use all that stuff. I don't see it as a deterrent. I actually create fairly complicated compositions using reflections and light spilling and blowing out backgrounds and not to get too geeky, but everything that you see on that screen, I'm intending it to be there. And if I don't want it there, I don't shoot it or I edit it out. But all of those little details are meant to be there. And sometimes that includes focus slashes that you're talking about. The reason why you're getting that is because when you turn the camera at a certain angle, you're going to see where the focus line is because the focal plane, you know, the, the thing you're shooting is at a perspective or at the side of where you're shooting. So when you, when you shoot, you'll see the line, but if it's more flat, you won't see the lines. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm. Yeah, it does make sense. I, I've never um, had to explain that before on a podcast <laughs> about this. Well, yeah. well, 
<laughs> as I say, I, I, there's a danger we go down the geeky technology route here, and I actually don't want to do that. What I do want to do is pick up on something you said there in terms of capturing the moment, and I think that talks to the storytelling. So talk to us a little bit about what's your approach to capturing images in a way that you know, there's a story behind that. There is that emotional connection I mentioned earlier and and capturing the moments that convince the potential customers then looking at those images to say, yes, I believe that person can help me with the thing that I'm looking for help for. Well, the one thing that I say about the photos that I capture is in most cases, it will never inspire your audience to sign on the dotted line at that very moment. That's not the mm -hmm. goal. The goal is to inspire that person to at least pick up the pen. Hmm. That's what this is about. You're not going to close because your photo looks awesome, but it will start a conversation. And when it comes to capturing emotion, it all starts before the session. It starts in the call, the strategy call, because while we're talking about, and this could be for virtual or in-person portraiture, we could be hmm. talking about, um, you know, logistics and the the types of photos they need and the outfits and for the in-person stuff what locations we're going to go to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. but what i'm also listening for is how do they respond to when i'm being sarcastic what's getting them really excited um in terms of uh their their response to me Where, where's the energy coming from and when i take those mental notes regarding their personality or at the very least finding out their why behind the things that they do that reveals a lot and it's the simplest question ever but what happens is that manifests itself in the types of expressions that we're going to capture during their session because at the end of the day my goal with these photos is to illustrate their personality, position them as the authority in uh, their space of expertise, and give them the visual assets they need to visually punctuate the sentiment of every single story that they tell, whether it's on their website, in a blog, on social, could be in a you know, in a description for a professional trade organization, it doesn't matter. They need the images for all of those particular stories. And that's what our goal is. And we get that through their expression, their body language, and the activity in which they are participating in within the photos. Hmm. Okay. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I'm really, um, I love it that you start off with a strategy and, Kind of define the purpose and also the starting the conversation because I think that's that's really key. Anything you can do as as an asset that you have to start conversations and the conversation itself is where the relationship starts to build. Hmm. Yeah, and the other thing is when I work with you know successful business owners of all different types, you know time is valuable and we want to ensure the most value out of this investment of their time and their money. And the only way to, to make sure that that happens is that from the beginning of the conversation all the way to when I deliver them the photos, I want to make sure that they're taken care of every step of the way and that there's clear communication and making sure we get what we need and over delivery. Hmm. All right. The um, one of the things I get confronted with quite often when I'm photographing people, and I, I certainly just do it casually, not not professionally, but often people will say, "I oh, don't photograph me. I don't look my best right now," or you know, "I don't like being on camera." So, how do you get past that when you're working professionally with people? Um, once I mean, once they've accepted that, hey, we need these assets, we need these photographs for my website, for my speaker page, for my uh, PR package, how do you get past this, I don't like being photographed? Uh, it depends on the person and it ties back to what we just talked about with the strategy call. Some people need a kick in the pants. Some people need a shoulder to cry on. Other people need to be uh, berated. <laughs> <laughs> Half kidding. Um, the reality is everyone is different and they all have a unique variable set that's going to kind of unlock the door and get them to drop their guard and be themselves. I had a shoot last weekend and I had to tough love her. 
and there were other people on the uh, in in the room, kind of kind of contributing, and I had to kind of come in and create the clear focus, right right in her face, and kind of basically say, listen, you know, do you think that the people that are going to hire you really care about the crap that bothers you when you're in front of the camera? No, mm. but they still pay you to do the thing that you do, right? Right. And there are more people out there that need your help, right? Yes. And you're trying to get out there and get out all the assets. At, yes. And build, 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 build. All right, then cut the crap. Let's go. You answered your own question. Stay with yeah. me. Listen to what I have to say. And just, just trust that we're going to take the ones that are great, get rid of the other stuff, uh, you know, and go from there. And, and it worked. Not everybody, that kind of thing works. Some people need a mm -hmm. different approach, but for her, that worked. And um, that's what it boils down. It's understanding what makes your client kind of, you have to be a therapist. That's basically <laughs> what it boils down to. I got a therapy yeah, yeah. hat. Yeah. Well, one of the things you said there, though, I think is absolute magic. And it's I, it can be applied across the board in in all kinds of marketing. Or, you know, I've had conversations with lots of people on this show about uh, their experts in uh, coaching people on public speaking and one of the things that comes up in those conversations is people afraid to get in on stage in front of an audience to do speaking and it's exactly the same kind of approach there to say well you know you've got something that will help people in a certain way and why would you withhold that why would you not present yourself in the best light so that those people who need that help who need your help can actually identify you as the person that can help them and and can get involved in that conversation that we talked about starting. Yeah, it's because it's scary and it's uncomfortable and you're out of your element, kind of similar to when someone has to sit in front of the laptop with me and look at 700 photos of their face consecutively. <laughs> they want to jump out a window. But at mm. the end of the day, yeah, the, the irony is that if you actually do those things, you follow through and you make those changes and help people get past the things holding them back. It's, it's probably the most gratifying thing that you can have outside of family. And then mm. people are afraid to do it. I get it, but I get it though. Hmm. All right. Now, how do you, um, you talked about strategy and how do you start off that strategy conversation and create the emotional connection with your client? Because I'm guessing that that is one of the fundamental pillars of of then building those photographs that that will create emotional connection with their clients. Oh, the first question that I ask everybody on the strategy call is why did you book this session and what are you looking to get out of it? Hmm. And then I get into asking them about their own business and the different aspects of their business what the, the tentacles you know how how is it disseminated out into the world how do you promote it and then as i mentioned before the big one follow up to all of it is why mm. and that's usually where i get a lot of juice about an intelligence into their personality you know and you get to really feel, especially you know if i don't know them that well and they'll answer that. And if they're being honest, it, it's it's uh, very revealing. And then, then we get into stuff about their personal life, their hobbies, other lifestyle activities, what inspires their business. There's, It's about 20, 30 questions, 20 something questions. And I have follow-ups. And from those answers, I have a shot sheet underneath, like a structure of the different types of uh elements we need to capture so it could be the headshot the portraits looking into the camera for the website and then it's the lifestyle activities you know what does brainstorming look like to you what does work look like to you what does working with clients look like to you there's a lot of overlap uh amongst experts but then there's a lot of nuances so for me yeah i work on my laptop yeah i i write with a pen and a paper you know yeah but some people use only pencil. some people only write on certain types of stationery some people like to whiteboard only for their ideas some people uh do in-person consultations uh only or they'll do it virtually like all of those little twists the little different things about the way they do their business 
are the things we need to capture because that's what creates that um, authentic way of presenting who you are, who you serve, and why you do what you do. Hmm. All right, that's fascinating. You, you mentioned there also uh, digging into some of their uh, personal life and lifestyle. Um, how does that play into the photography and, and why is that important? It's for some for some clients, it's important for others. It's not so much. But for the ones that it works for, it's it gives experts an opportunity to connect with their audience beyond the work. So it makes you, you know, sharing lifestyle images of people, you know, doing their hobbies or just relaxing or reading a book or meditating listening to an audio book, whatever the case may be, these things give uh, opportunities for audience members to have an entry point into that expert's life because, hey, I listened to the same thing. It was really awesome. And then you start an engagement. And when you share this stuff, it also opens up your ability to not only share the uh, expertise that you have, but also kind of give a glimpse into kind of, well, I was going to say how the sausage is made. <laughs> you know, how you live your life, how yeah. you live your life, how, how uh, and then how that can be relatable to your audience and kind of make you, because you want to be the superhero that solves problems. And that's a lot of your content that people share. And, but you also want to be relatable because you don't want to be too intimidating and too over the top and too unapproachable because you're on the mountaintop and you, you know, so the way that you come down that mountain and meet your audience halfway is by sharing aspects of your life that they can relate to. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. All right. Now you, you talk about persuasive visual storytelling and there's obviously a lot of uh, persuasive elements in what you've just shared in terms of being relatable to your audience. What, what a, what do you understand by that term persuasive visual storytelling? Well, persuasive visual storytelling relates to the opportunity for an expert to capture the attention of people that they that need their help the most by simply being themselves. There's a lot of within certain types of uh, areas of the expert based community, there could be a lot of uh, putting on a show. To say that lightly, there's, there's, mm. there's, you know, I'm renting a car, I'm going to take a photo in front of it, or look at my plane, yeah. that's not really my plane, yeah, yeah, yeah. like crap like that. I mean, listen, live your life, do what you got to do. But the people that I serve, that's not their thing. They don't do that. So one of the things that I stress in my work is all about creating that opportunity for that emotional connection that people get when they when when they're looking at an image and they look at that photo and they say either I want to learn more or I like this person or what's that all about or ooh that person's an expert in the thing that I'm looking to hire an expert and okay let me find out more it's meant to be uh the photos that ignite a conversation that ignite an opportunity for something to happen after that, rather than just, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm amazing, I do amazing things, you know? And that's what we try to avoid. Persuasion by simply tapping into yourself and sharing that with everybody else, with who you serve specifically. Hmm. So it's building authenticity or supporting authenticity. Yeah, it's honesty. It's being honest with yourself. It's presenting yourself in a way that is, um, it feels very home. And then you're projecting that out to everyone else. So that because listen, we're qualifying, qualification is a two way street, right? It's a two way street in that yes, you know, as a photographer, people are looking at my portfolio, they're looking at my price tag, but the way that I s set up what I do, it's not just about the portfolio and the price tag. It's about the person. It's about me behind the camera because you have to deal physically with me. And as, as a consumer, you want to work with people that you like. 
right? Mm. So the way that you help allow people the opportunity to truly qualify you, I put out content that sounds, looks, and is exactly me in my voice, in my tone, with my attitude, with my expertise, along with the skill behind the camera to deliver the images. But while I am doing that part of the qualification process of putting out content that, that is my PR company, you know, that represents my personality, I am qualifying out people that would find me to not be a fit for them and their personality. Because I don't want to work with people that don't resonate with me as much as they don't want to work with me. And either way, it's all good things because we're saving each other the time of getting on a phone call and realizing oh this isn't this isn't working so that's why i do that hmm. yeah that there's another bit of gold there in what you've shared it's kind of qualifying people out that aren't a good fit so it's the two-way street that you mentioned in terms of in terms of the photography on your site um, to me um, in having done a little bit of research and having looked through some of the photography and now getting to meet you in person and speak to you, I'm I'm feeling really comfortable because it's it's all very consistent, which I think is is a key part of how you go about that. And I have to say, um, Terry Trespicio, who we've had on ah, the show yeah. um, a while back, and I've been following her work and been communicating with her quite regularly. So I, I know a little bit about her and I know her character a little bit. And when she announced probably about a month ago or so her new website and she put it up and asked people to take a look and give us some feedback. So I took a look at it and I thought, wow, the photography there is absolutely fabulous. It really, to me, it just captured Terry the way Terry is and the way I know her. And then at some point she mentioned in, in at the end of the um, email, I think she mentioned that you were the one that took the photography and no, I thought, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. And I was, I was thinking I, I've got you on the show coming up soon. So I'm really uh, excited. I, I was more excited after I read uh, her email and looked at the work you did for her. Yeah, it was a small, we, we did that literally right before everything shut down. So we yeah. just got that in, but uh, she's fantastic. Yeah. I uh, and and I'm 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 glad that uh, the consistency of me speaking and the way that I present myself is there. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> I'll let you know that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, what makes a good visual story then? If you know, if I'm saying, okay, I, I want to get some photography done, but what do I need to uh, be aware of that it's more than just still images of me doing things? or maybe not even doing things, just posing for the camera? Uh, well, it depends on what we're talking about here. Are we talking about a project for a strategy for social media? Is it for a website? Are you promoting something specifically? What, do you, what are you doing? Is this just in general, like the general things for a portfolio to have? Hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's a good question. I mean, I was just thinking in general terms, but what you've highlighted there is you know, it's got to be that's not enough it's not be enough. specific to purpose yes yeah. yes it all counts but as a general rule w the way that i set up my clients for the most part depending on what service they invest in which relates to how much time we're going to work together actually in front of the camera uh, with them in front of the camera we're talking uh couple of headshots, like the tight framed shots that go right directly into your social profiles, uh, profile pictures. We're thinking some wider portraits where you're looking into the camera, but it reveals more of your outfit and clothing. You want those. Those are great for your website as banners. Um, and then we want to fill more of your portfolio with again the stuff before that i was talking about we want to show your audience how the sausage is made so we want to see your process photos we want to see those brainstorming shots you working whatever that looks like you working with clients whatever that looks like 
And then from there, I would ask a series of other questions related to, uh, do you do a podcast? Well, we want to see what that looks like. How much time do you use for virtual photography? We want to see what that looks like. So we start building the menu based on the questions in the strategy call that ultimately decide what goes into the portfolio. But for no, ma no matter who I shoot, headshot and a wider portrait in different outfits is, is like the standard. You have to have at least those two things. And then everything else we kind of figure out as we go based on your particular needs. Hmm. So the headshot and the, the two outfit sort of half body shot is the staple or the foundation. And, that, and, and, yeah. and, and I would also say, I'm sorry to cut you, but uh, if it's on a, uh, uh, depending upon if I have very little time or a lot of time, what I'll end up doing is, is photograph the, the portraits of them, maybe on a white background so that either they can use that white background for text in the negative space mm -hmm. and their their logo and such or promote something or it's really easy for a graphic designer to cut them out put them in a composite somewhere with like a funky background and some other kind of elements so white background portraits also work even though i prefer to shoot ones of people with a lot of depth so it's just blurry and all the attention goes to their face mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, coming back to the virtual photography, how do you achieve some of those things in the virtual photography? So, you know, for example, you talked about the um, blurring the background and getting the focus on their face. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm thinking in more general terms, you know, that emotional connection, that uh, image of, let's say, somebody speaking to an audience versus somebody presenting in a virtual environment how do you kind of capture those images in a way that it it's a really powerful connecting story well that again brings up two questions is this a live event or are we staging this in front of a fake audience or is there no one in the room at all hmm. if it's live i don't have to do anything i treat it like it's a live event i mean i don't I don't need to confer with someone before they go on a stage. So I just, my is to kind of see what flexibility I have within Zoom in terms of being able to switch from gallery mode to um, speaker mode to side-by-side -side mode and what are the elements that they have and, you know, what does the audience look like? Like when I flip to the audience, does it look like half of them are in witness protection program because the lighting is absolutely disgusting yeah, yeah. and it's going to make the quality of these photos look like crap? Or am I working with a room of people with smiley faces and it looks really great? Because if it is, I'm going to shoot that. But in terms of blurring uh, what you're talking about, like the, the more technical thing, it, it has to do with my lens choice and the angles at which I shoot. So I shoot my laptop pretty much from a 180 degree horizon from the edge of the of the screen all the way around everything's in play so um what i do is basically shoot straight on low high angles and the whole idea is to kind of capture the speaker in his or her element when they're doing their thing with what every speaker has like little subtleties to the way that they punctuate when they talk and they want to enunciate with the hand and, you know, make it really mm. powerful. So I kind of spend the first couple of minutes, if I don't know the speaker, kind of getting a feel for their, their cadence and getting a feel for their pauses and their body language, because I'm internalizing that because I'm timing out when I think I should start uh, firing up the shutter button because it's weirder to shoot on a screen because of the fact that there is a intermediary between me and the subject. So I have to overshoot a little bit because of the blur factor with people moving on a screen. It's not like I can freeze the image like I can in real life. So, so it's give and take, it's a little bit of experiment, but we, we kind of figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, um, there was something that came to mind there, but the, the, First question now that's top of mind is, um, do you prefer the live event or the real event versus the staged event? Is it easier to do? Oh, you mean uh, live and staged on virtual? Yeah. Um, it depends. 
because if it's a live event with like hundreds of people and they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff with like uh uh like like i i mean i have shot the things i've shot over 140 events this year uh virtual events uh some of them were five days and three days spread out so you see what these people have in, it's it's incredible the creativity that people have come up with but the thing that i like about staged shoots where i'm i have my audio open the whole time and i'm directing them i mean i enjoy that that's what i do it feel even though it's weird and it's strange to sh to shoot with a screen still to this day you know i mean i'm used to it but it's still odd yeah. um the staged component really gives me and the client the opportunity to play and get a ton of variety, different outfits, different slide decks that they can leverage because it's not a live event. So it's like, all right, I got enough of that one. Change the slide, go to the other deck that we talked about, change the color. I've had, I've had clients change their color palettes on their slides because, you know, we've used it for different things. You know, you can't do that when it's a real event. Mm -hmm. But real events are real events, and there's still something cool. But nothing beats real live events in person. Yeah, yeah. That's in person. Yeah, that's right. You remember those, right? You remember those. Yeah, yeah. vaguely, vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do some again soon. In fact, I, we, um, I'm a volunteer director of our local community bank, and we had our annual general meeting yesterday, and it's the first time we've done that on Zoom. So it was quite a challenge but it came oh, i'm sure came across very well everybody was quite impressed we did do a couple of rehearsals to make sure that we got it right but certainly it was a lot more challenging than the in-person version of those agms the audience doesn't need to know what happened uh on the back end of this thing don't worry about it. it's <laughs> yeah. fine it's fine all right um yeah, the other the other thing that came, did come to mind before you were talking about um, photographing a Zoom meeting and the different audience members um, looking like gangsters because they were poorly lit and so on. Uh, <laughs> give, give us a few tips. Give us a few tips from your experience about uh, going on a Zoom meeting and actually having good lighting and maybe good audio and and maybe just being a good audience member as opposed to the people that are presenting all other yeah that for them too obviously yeah it's funny i've given notes for when we do staged audiences i've given notes to the uh producers of that thing to put together mm -hmm. so that these people don't look like that i remember that <laughs> uh the key the key th there's a couple keys i mean and i'm not gonna say go out and buy tons of lighting and get a microphone and do all of this crazy stuff i mean very simple things for example if you have the ability to adjust the height of your computer so if you're on a if you have a laptop the key is to always have this thing this this camera this green or blue light depending or, or red whatever your computer is but whatever that light that signifies the webcam have it eye level or right at about the level where your earlobes are somewhere floating between because your earlobes are lower a little bit lower than your eyes so you want to hover in that area so that they're not shooting that that the other people on the call are not looking up your nose or you're shooting down your shirt that's number one eye level is important number two do not sit in front of a window please stop doing that you're hurting my feelings when i have to tell you to move i had to do that i had to do that yesterday morning i'm just like yeah you can't because it looks crazy you look like an apparition or something that's weird <laughs> but in terms of lighting when it comes to if you have full flexibility with respect to picking up the laptop and moving around my suggestion is to find a window and use it in front of you because the lighting that comes through through the window use it as a uh, benefit and not a distraction so leverage the light that comes first of all every video blog that i have pretty much ever shot has been done using my bedroom window only as lighting and and I'm a producer, so I'm trying to get away with it and be lazy. But the point is, is it works. And then the third thing would be um, background. Be cognizant of what's in your background, because guess what? On a long call, people are just going to be completely distracted. If it's like, for example, in my 
and I have that, but I have that intentionally. But when I present, I don't have that there necessarily. But the point is, you know, you got to be, uh, I'm referring to That's in my Viking, Viking head. Helmet. Yeah, I have a Viking helmet in the back of my head uh, on this call. And since you can't see it, <laughs> but the point is, don't have that if you're presenting or if you're in the audience, because people are just going to stare at that stuff. So eye level, be, uh, daylight window, use it to your advantage. Or if you have a lamp, something that you could kind of put near you behind the laptop, but in front of your face to kind of illuminate you and uh, declutter the background and watch for anything weird. Hmm. What's your view on the virtual backgrounds? They suck usually. <laughs> and it's not because Zoom dropped the ball on it. It's because when you do green screen, you know, I come from an industry where, you know, green screen was not easy for a very long time because the chips in the camera, the sensitivity, there was a, there was a lot of, it, it was a mess. It, it, it was a skill and an art. I shouldn't say a mess. It was, it was challenging to properly light a green screen subject in video. Now it's like, oh, I hit a button. Oh, why doesn't it work? Well, maybe because you're lighting it with a desk lamp. That's kind of a problem. You know, you have to be, you, when you use that virtual background, you got to pump enough of light, not just for you, but also for that background. And you have to learn the technology uh, on how to massage the technical elements of it so that when you move your hand, it doesn't disappear into the background, which is often the case. If you nail it, it looks amazing. I've seen some people that have done very fantastic work with it but not many because many just don't understand the nuance of how to actually work with a green screen. In fact, some people, instead of putting the virtual background just wherever, some people have actually bought the green paper and that really helps. And then when you bring in lights to light that background separate from you, that helps. And then when you light yourself on top of all of that, that's the best mm -hmm. option. All right. Well, there's lots of good, uh, tips there and and i guess the key one is lighting from the front and well the two key ones for me lighting from the front and camera at eye level so um yeah we, we had uh, a competition recently and these have all gone virtual as well speaking competition with toastmasters and this was at um at a higher level competition as well so these were all very accomplished speakers they'd come through a couple of rounds Mm -hmm. And I was amazed to see that some people were sitting down at their desk doing a, a speech, which I thought is kind of not really a speech in my eyes. But a lot of them had either they were looking down at the camera, um, which gives you the feeling of they're looking down at you, or like you say, you're looking up their nose, or they yeah. were um, the camera was kind of looking down on top of them, so you could see some of them were older gentlemen, so you could see the shiny top of their head and yes yeah i mean listen at the end of the day uh there's still a learning curve out there and pe some people when they're not on a stage you don't feel like they're actually need to do any of the window dressing but as we evolve this this uh you know virtual thing on such a grand level i mean even when we go back to doing in persons this stuff's not going to go away it's mm. it, it's such a cost saver for a lot of industries so it would be it would behoove them to keep a certain amount of this going which means the production quality of what you present virtually still needs it needs to constantly improve basically and yeah. uh doing that kind of stuff is not going to work after a while mm. yeah i agree and I think it's also opened up a whole lot of opportunities that people perhaps didn't recognize before, um, particularly, you know, now we're no longer geographically bound. We can still come back to those in-person meetings which have a geographic location, but we can use the online meetings to essentially connect with people all around the world as long as they've got an internet connection. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of benefit to this, you know. I mean, obviously people miss being on the road and and again nothing beats the energy of a, of a live mm. room when someone on that stage is doing their thing 
I mean, it's, it's magical. That's why people fly to go to these things, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. want to be inspired. Um, but that, but having said that, having been in front of this screen for seven months, shooting a wide variety of speakers, presenters, experts of all different shapes, sizes, and flavors, um, you know, you can still get an amazing product as someone to, uh, hire a team to put together an event for your company. I mean, you can still get a lot of value out of it. It's just different, but it doesn't make it any less valuable. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think the two can work together and sure. give, uh, grow the opportunity going forward when we get back to the time of having those in-person events and traveling around the place, but also adding in the uh, virtual events where the in-person is for whatever reason not possible or it gives you a wider reach. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to that day again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, fabulous, John. Uh, this has um, been wonderful. I could keep on going talking for ages. I've got a whole lot of technical questions about photography, but I think they might be better dealt with offline. Yeah, don't, uh, scare, don't scare anybody with that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um it's probably a good time now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions, and hopefully you'll give us an answer that'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. No pressure, it's fine. No. Let's see what happens. <laughs> What's what do you think is the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Right. Right. <laughs> oh, so, do you want do you want me to elaborate? Well, I was I was going to ask the follow up question. So, when you mean write, as in uh, writing articles, writing journals? Yes, yes. Right, writing period. Because one of the one of the intangible benefits of creating content through writing is the idea of getting your brain to go through a lot of reps with respect to thinking about your insights and your process and challenging your insights and your process. And that happened at that. I only discovered that after I started writing three blogs a week, about a couple of years ago, the level of insight just is skyrocketed because of the fact that I constantly try to get out new ideas and work on other ideas and mold them into new things. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a way of forcing you to articulate what's going on inside your mind. Yeah, because once it's out on paper and you can read it, now next thing you know, you can you can work to modify it or make it better. Hmm. All right, wonderful. And what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? <laughs> I just answered that. <laughs> uh, I'll give you another one. Uh, to generate new ideas, what have I done? I like, I have a routine. I have a brainstorm routine that I like to do that involves, uh, music sitting outside my apartment with a vodka soda and two rounds of that. And I open up my phone in my notebooks app and I, um, I develop different ideas through that. Now, yes, I'm writing, but it's that process that falls. Like right now, I'm already thinking about that like a couple hours down the line because I have some work I need to do and I'm kind of saving it for that moment. So hmm. creating a pro so creating a process uh, yeah. for you to be able to uh, have time to be creative within your schedule. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. And and also an envir creating an environment where you're relaxed enough to go through that process. It becomes less, hey, I'm tricking myself because I'm drinking booze and I'm listening to music, but I am actually working. Hmm. And that's that's the key because uh, my brain's used to being productive at that time now. So, hmm. All right. Well, what's a favorite re resource that you use uh, most often, perhaps when you're doing that writing and that, that brainstorming? Oh, my favorite resource is Google Drive. It is a godsend. Because I am able to create an idea on my Chromebook in my living room, go out to go get some coffee at Starbucks and keep working on the idea on my phone, 
come home and actually uh, finish it up and start get ready to schedule it somewhere on my laptop in my office. And that's the kind of freedom or uh, not freedom, but flexibility that really has helped me kind of propel my opportunities to be creative and innovate on my own ideas. Hmm. Yeah, it is. A, it is a wonderful tool, isn't it? There's a, all the different software and basically live update. And the other thing you didn't mention there is you can actually work together with other people live on. Uh, on. Yeah. Oh, you know what? You're right. And I have done that in the past. It is pretty awesome. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, what's the best way to keep a client on track? How do you go about it when, I mean, you, you talked earlier about uh, different approaches for different people, but the best way to keep them on track is to understand what approach will resonate with them most so i mean that's that's not an, a full answer but that is the reality i mean in most cases it generally just involved me busting their chops by saying something <laughs> that's going to uh remind them that they uh need to uh step it up <laughs> yeah. in the most so diplomatic way to describe that i believe we've achieved it so yeah, yeah. But it, it comes back to building that emotional connection first, right? Absolutely. It, mm. it, you know, we're in the, uh, you know, I'm not in the widget business. I'm in the relationship business. And it, it's not only selling image content that helps develop relationships for my clients with their audience, but it's also the way that I live my life and how we bring people in. And it's a pretty magical thing. Yeah. Well, I wish more businesses who, think they're in the widget bid, bid, in the widget business and produce widgets would take the philosophy of that they're actually in the relationship business. Hey, listen, some people get it later than others. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Lean in to who you are and own every step of it and present that in a way that cannot be confused with anyone else. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. So, and and of course, we've been talking about photography in that light today. So that's that's certainly one way to present that in a way that won't be confused with others. And the way you you go about it is a powerful way to do that. Yeah, that's the whole persuasive visual storytelling piece. That's why that needs to be there because when you are unmistakably yourself unapologetically yourself that's going to draw people in and repel people away as uh, seth godin said people like us do things like this hmm. and the whole goal is to find the people who do things like this like hire people like you to yeah. come in and you know help help with the process so that's what it's hmm. about yeah love it and that quotes from the um, book, This Is Marketing, right? Yes, I love that book. That book is great. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, John. This has been absolutely fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you, take a look at your portfolio, um, maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared with us today? Well, they can find me on my website, johndomato.com. If anyone is interested in learning more about persuasive visual storytelling or anything related to branded lifestyle portraiture or virtual photography as i mentioned earlier i write a blog and i'd be more than happy to email you my blogs you can just sign up for that on my website as well and i'm all over social tomato photo on instagram and twitter and come say hi great all right well we'll post all those links in the show notes. Thanks for that. Now, do you have any parting advice for our listener today? Yeah. I would say that when it comes to your image content, don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't uh, pretend to be something you're not. You're magical just the way you are. <laughs> Great. I love it. You're magical just the way you are. It's brilliant. All right. Well, thanks, John. Now, finally, who's somebody else who I should have on this show and why? Good question. Wow. Off the top of my head, who the... Hmm. My God. 
Uh, I have a name, Ramon Ray. Mm -hmm. He's a speaker. He just popped into my head. All right. Well, we'll um, we'll get introduced to Ramon with uh, from you and reach out to him and have him on the show. Sure. Yeah. Great. Love it. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today. I, as I say, I could go on talking about all the technology behind uh, capturing images and funny photos and so on, but uh, we'll save that for another day and maybe even just for a conversa personal conversation where we can geek out and have fun. Sure. So thanks for all the insights you've shared today. I've really had fun. Hope you have too. And I'm looking forward to sharing this with my audience. So all the best for the future and let's stay in touch. Yes, absolutely. I hope you enjoyed that informative and engaging conversation with John and took something away from this episode. John's approach to photographing his clients in a way that tells their story and connects them emotionally to their dream clients is something that I really like. I'd love to know what you took away from John's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash John D'Amato. That is J-O-H-N-D-E-M-A-T-O. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash John D'Amato. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with John, as well as links to his website, his social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in the conversation today. If you like this episode, please share it with two other people that it might help. Tag me in that share and I'll reach out to you with a special surprise. John suggested that we have a conversation with Ramon Ray of Smart Hustle on a future InnovaBuzz podcast episode. So Ramon, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast courtesy of John D'Amato. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got even more fantastic guests lined up including podcaster and co-host of Podthon, Lee Wehara and the wealth mentor, Jackson Milan. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.